Okay. Perhaps before I start, I, I, I announced this title like months and months ago, but I want to change it in the meantime, but I haven't changed it. But I would rather be like boundary maintenance than an archaeology of resistance. Okay? But if one believes the likes of uh, Brodel, Horden, Purcell, or Broodbank, the Mediterranean has always been an open sea, as Manning recently called it, an area in which connectivity played a major role, where mobility, exchange, and communication were of prime importance, where human societies and relations were entangled with the sea itself, and most of the contributions of this uh, workshop session actually pay attention to this interaction. And I'm not going to go against that either. So. Coastal and island communities, it is argued, developed networks with some sites gradually being promoted as emporia or hubs where goods and services were collected and distributed through terrestrial or maritime networks. It was surely this entanglement, it is claimed, that resulted in a remarkable cultural uniformity and cultural grandeur at a series of punctuated moments during this long history of this extended sea land. Through a web of interconnectedness, people moved, new ideas spread, and objects were traded. Now, while advances in DNA and various types of isotope research have been instrumental in framing processes of exchange and mobility, it is especially social network analysis, following in the footsteps of world systems theory and peer polity interaction, which has proved to be a powerful tool in the simulation of past interaction. This is argued by Carl Nappet, and Fulminanti and Nappet have worked on this, is because it allowed moving beyond simple distribution maps and paying attention to the sites itself, to nodes, to connectivity, to directionality, and to frequency. Likewise, various types of GIS and spatial modeling have helped considerably uh, in fleshing out earlier studies so that were simply based on shared material cultural attributes or the movement of commodities from one to another. The force of both social network analysis and GIS lies, however, in the recognition of presence, not of absence, of sites, features, or shared material culture between spatially distinct nodes as proxies for human interaction. And, though, and although Cossinets, and as well as Beaven and Wilson, have discussed the importance of absent variables, resulting from an incomplete record or recovery bias in a general remedial way to reconstruct spatial or social networks. My paper looks especially in the potential alternatives to explain such absences, to look at those that seemingly stayed outside or were neglected by networks. And I do this focusing again on the island of Crete and its Manoan or Bronze Age culture. Bevan and Wilson start from the assumption that quite a few sites had not yet been identified or localized and by using spatial modeling, we're able to fill in the landscape and to visualize flows between settlements and reconstruct potential hierarchies and territorial organizations. Their analysis, combined with that of uh, Napat Rivers and Evans on Crete's international network, and a good deal of other material cultural studies, and I'll just show you the recent volume by uh, Gorgoyani et Ali, gives the impression that Crete was a very connected and tangled island indeed, both internally and externally linked, and it's very likely that this was truly the case. However, while such approaches are useful to obtain general synthetic historical reconstructions, they are largely based on positive evidence, the presence of imports, while neglecting or downscaling the fact that most sites have not or barely yielded the material correlates, which, which would allow them to take up convincing positions as nodes in some kind of maritime network. In fact, exotica on Crete are rare, dare I say, overrated. For most of its Bronze Age history, if they show up at all, they form a tiny percentage of all kinds, much less than 1% of the finds in each site. This can be compared, for example, with late Bronze Age Pila Kokinokremos on Cyprus, where imports form almost 20% of the encountered material. And sometimes it actually increases by, the, by, by context. You know? What we do observe, however, is much minor material in off-island sites. You know? 
At Acoretiri, on Santorini, this is around 15%, while on Kithara, it's said almost to be entirely Minoan, at least according to sources in Napata and Nikolopoulou. This clearly shows the Minoans' entanglement with the wider uh, Aegean or Mediterranean world. It's almost like finding like Chinese products everywhere, but nothing foreign in China itself. So in the rest of this paper, I will only consider material evidence, because um, uh, which certainly uh, formed a small percentage of exchangeable commodities, such as perishable goods, uh, foodstuffs, textiles, intangible ideas, technology, as well human traffic. But these need much more sophisticated analysis to be appreciated. But if we look at the Cretan evidence uh, and check where foreign products primarily and consistently draw, uh, show up, Comos, Poros, Poros and Moklos, these are port sites or anchorage sites, if you wish, uh, that are secondary in the local settlement hierarchy, respectively on the south, north, and northeast coast. These are maybe what you could call gateway communities, but they're not primary centers uh, where uh, their respective regions are concerned. And the presence of exotica in these three sites is, with regard to other Cretan sites, proportionally relatively high throughout the various periods of Minoan history, and this is why they're usually regarded as gateway communities, sites through which exotic goods enter the island and from which it is usually argued they were distributed or proliferated. That's yeah. Brannigan's original 1991 idea. Papadazes and Tompkins, for instance, conclude that trading was not a widely, accept, uh, widely accessible venture, but it was controlled by groups of individuals located in a few large trading communities. Again, these are secondary sites. These are not major sites. This may have been so, so these trading communities, but is there really evidence that these exotic goods subsequently arrived or filtered through the other settlements? In fact, as outside these gateway communities, foreign goods are really scarce. And despite long histories of excavation, the main palatial settlements, Knossos, Festos, and Malia, have yielded very few imports and this only changes somewhat in the Mycenaean period, late Minoan 3a, where Knossos is concerned at least. Two further examples where I've been or I'm working myself, that is Palaikastro in East Crete, is following 100 years intermittently of archaeological research, a large and important settlement located on primarily land and sea routes with visual linkage to the Dodecanese, so if you actually, and on a good day you can see actually castles and then next car covers, roads and Anatolia, yeah? possessing an important agricultural hinterland and undoubtedly at the top of a regional settlement hierarchy. So all conditions are in fact met to see it as an important node in an overseas network. But foreign products are really <coughs> rare. Trinkets, as it were, like uh, occasional things that show up. Same goes for the site that we've been digging at, like at Sisi. Uh, on the north coast of the island, only three kilometers from the palatial center of Malia, but also located on, on really very good communication arteries, has a long history, and has been extensively excavated, but no foreign products at all. Well, though, so this absence seems almost certainly not a recovery bias. So we should ask why sites that are ideally located on appropriate sea currents lack distinctive and recognizable exotic material culture. Well, we know that in general that the island was in close contact with the rest of the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean, as hinted at by these uh, gateway communities mentioned. So how can we explain this absence? Well, in regions with strong state interference, trade monopolies and embargoes, uh, 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 in state interference, trade monopolies and embargoes may have existed. Uh, we know through texts, for instance, that Eric Klein has uh, treated, that rulers occasionally used such embargoes as a political tool. And so during a specific period of the Bronze Age, and I suppose you were actually uh, hinting at that, Hittite finds, for example, are quasi absent from the Mediterranean. And so that has been in print, interpreted as an embargo. While a treaty between Hittites and Amuru of 1250 BC also called for a mutual trade embargo against the Osirians. A Megarian decree proposed by Pericles in 433 excluded merchants from Athenian markets and ports. And Romans and Carthaginians, so, well, speaker, have uh, also regularly imposed such, such bans on each other. 
Embargoes, however, would result in the general and not selected absence of exotica. And since exotica are somehow present in ports, this explanation does not, not, does not seem applicable. No. Still, a local embargo could have prevented their proliferation outside their points of arrival. Now, in the art of not being governed, James Scott, inspired by Pierre Clastres' Society Against the State, discusses mon modern day communities that willingly and reactively remain outside nation states for the fear of being exploited, developing way of escapism. Community like these often look for borderlands or shadow zones. And Alfredo González Rubal, I don't know if he's there, but he's certainly present somewhere, uh, on three groups in Western Ethiopia is a good case study with material culture used to underline independence and resistance. But these authors wrote from a clear anarchist perspective. While cultural resistance does not need a particular political condition to be operational. In fact, a culture of resistance and the creation of physical or social boundaries to enable continual existence of traditions is what Bath called boundary maintenance. And through the construction of social confines, communities or groups are able to maintain their identity when members interact with others. When members interact with others, they do this especially. This not only demands the creation of group membership criteria and ways of signaling on these, but also indicates a conscious structuring of interactions, which allows the persistence of the cultural differences. It is an us and them game. This happens at all scales, from the household to the level of the largest community, and often takes the form of purposeful or imposed choices made through material culture, as uh, Maguire and Painter, for instance, or Rycroft have Shows, uh, have shown. Boundary maintenance, however, reinforces a group's uni unity and distinctness by emphasizing traits that set its member apart from others. Although it's mostly studies, studied as a strategy to protect the exploitation of spatially restricted resources, and especially marine ones especially, it is also a protective mechanism against cultural debt in which, through a total acculturation, the disappearance of local culture is avoided. And so, not as a joke, but perhaps the Amish community can be mentioned as an eloquent but quite extreme example of such boundary maintenance. But it is a community of practice that is encountered in many societies. In specific archaeological contexts, boundary maintenance and processes of resistance have successfully, successfully been employed to explain, for instance, anomalous mortuary ceremonialism in pre-contact Vermont, or a particular style of personal ornament setting locals apart from incoming Neolithic farmers in Europe, or Copper Age tribal societies on the Great Hungarian Plain, as Parkinson has shown, or the, even the maintenance of Philistine identity in the early Iron Age. Doric Sparta and Crete too, among archaic Greek city-states, were known for their practices of cultural resistance and the ethnic label Cretans or true Cretans may refer to this as Whitley suggested. But these examples illustrate the use of material culture in helping to shape and to maintain boundaries and hence community identity. And practices through which social cultural differences were ascribed in community communicated act hence as a defensive mechanism. The isolated exotic object does not change this perception since either it may have been stigmatized Boring. or it was not considered sensitive, it didn't matter. In the latter case, it may have crossed group boundaries and be adopted or adapted, as we see, for instance, on Crete, uh, with uh, another monster, the transformation of the Egyptian Tawaret in the Minoan genius, uh, or with several technologies, including the potter's wheel. It didn't matter too much, it was interesting. But boundary maintenance, in particular, allows us to stress Cretan particularism and the originality of its Bronze Age culture and the many forms it took, the stress on the central court, for instance, and its accessibility in public structures, um, for example, for the gathering, as Piotr has mentioned, but also the link with the natural environment where religious practices are concerned, and later its attention to a primary female divinity. But key cultural traits that may be considered as meaningful locally abound in the Manoan material record. Dress and hairstyle, for instance, 
are very typical of Minoan, but also model plaster and frescoes, shapes and decorative styles of pottery, symbolism such as the double axe, etc. The list is without an ending. And one may be confident that things like food and language were likewise primary markers. Minoans, it appears, wanted to be recognizable as such. This distinctive material cultural and, at first glance, unreceptiveness towards external influences, however, can only be appreciated while taking into account the island's primary position within a network of entanglements in the Eastern Mediterranean context. It was because of this primary entanglement that Cretans developed and adhered to their own specific cultural item which set them apart from their neighbors. It is, it is this what made them Cretans. It was an intentional and deliberate move to protect local customs within a world that became more and more international and globalized. It must be added that this general unreceptiveness to foreign uh, features appears to have been temporarily charged, and especially a middle and early late Bronze Age feature of Cretan society. This then may in fact imply that it is a conscious reaction <coughs> against experiences in the past. Exotica, in fact, do seem to have occupied a very important place in the advertisement of local identity and the construction of vertical differentiation during the early Bronze Age, as has been shown in various studies by Cynthia Colburn and especially Borja Lejara Herrero. It was surely because of their use and such vertical uh, differentiation, differentiation blatant show off that they were largely discouraged or rejected in a society that, that, that seemed to have advertised more egalitarian principles, corporatism and collective identity. That's the ideology. It doesn't mean that it was true uh, in uh, reality. It is then perhaps no surprise that when the court-centered buildings, which we know as palaces, are built early in the Middle Bronze Age, foreign exotica do no longer play a, a role in local identity construction and advertisement. So to conclude, the Mediterranean Sea, while it may have been something like a no man's land and an interface that allowed free and human connections between various groups, also, also acted as a borderland and a barrier that helped the creation of local identities through re a receptiveness or not, an active use or not of foreign material culture. Yeah. The island of Crete, with its enduring network of multiple entanglements, after a period of trial and error, seemed to have consciously and deliberately steered away from the use of exotica because its potential use in a vertical hierarchy made it incompatible with local sensitivities and an ideology of collectiveness, collectiveness even if this was evidently a mirage. Thank you.